كلمات الله التامات من شر ما خلق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله Julia Brown was a well-known voodoo practitioner and witch in her small town in Louisiana. People knew her for her charms and her curses, as well as the creepy songs that she would sing on her porch with her guitar. In her community, people would come to her and she would perform a number of different rituals for them. That was until people started to take advantage of her, so she started to get back at them. When they came to her, she would scare them by telling them predictions like they're gonna die soon or bad things were coming for them. Then the local Locals were like, okay, hey, what's going on with her? Close to her death, Julia started to act strange. She would constantly sing songs about her death and how she would get revenge on the town. One song that she would sing goes as so, when I die, I take the whole town with me. When I die, I take the whole town. Not a very cheery and upbeat song if you ask me. In fact, no one knew what she was talking about until the day that she passed away. On September 29th, 1952, Julia passed away. On that day, the town came together for her funeral. Well, as they were lowering her casket into the ground, rain came down hard. This rain later turned into a disastrous hurricane that wiped out the entire town. So it's believed that before she left, she put a curse on the town, which is what she meant by, when I die, I'm taking the whole town with me. Over the years, a number of people have attempted to rebuild the town, but every time they do, it ends up getting destroyed again. Maybe her curse is real then. In our fourth spot today, we have Gerald Gardner. Gerald Gardner is often called the father of modern witchcraft, and that's due to the fact that he founded Wicca. Although technically he learned it from a group of people and then went on to just write about it, so they gave him credit for it. But anyways, basically back in 1939, he said that one night he encountered a group of women who claimed to be witches. They stripped him of his clothes and put him in the middle of a ceremonial circle. The circle was lined with naked women and they showed him their ways. From there, he learned briefly about Wigga and thought, hey, this is great, let's preserve this and make sure that everyone knows about it. In 1954, he actually created a book titled Witchcraft Today that teaches others how to embrace Wicca fully. He then went on and became obsessed with the occult. In fact, it's believed that a number of Wiccans and pagans were saved partly because of him. They could come out and be like, yeah, I'm a witch, without fear of being hanged or burned alive. To this day, he's one of the most relevant witches in history, but also one of the more controversial ones. In our third spot today, we have Mother Shipton. Mother Shipton, otherwise known as Ursula Sonthiel, was born in 1488 England. Legend has it that she was born during a massive thunderstorm and her mother gave birth to her in a cave. Her mother was only 15 at the time and was stuck raising Ursula in that cave by herself. That was until the monastery took her mother in and a local family took Ursula in. Eventually her mom was taken to a nunnery and they never saw each other again. Growing up, Ursula had a hard time fitting in. She had a large crooked nose, her back had a bend in it, and her legs were twisted. So right off the bat, people were like, yeah, she's a witch, just because of her appearance. In fact, people would bully her and call her hag face. Others believed her father was the devil. It didn't help that her mom refused to tell anyone who the father of her child was. So people were like, yeah, for sure. Her father's the devil. Not only that, she would spend a lot of time by the cave that she was born in. Now, how did she get the name Mother Shipton? Well, eventually she went on to marry a man named Tobias Shipton, and she took his last name. She eventually did partake in witchcraft and would make magical remedies for the sick. So people called her Mother Shipton because she was like a mother to all. At one point in her life, she became psychic and could see into the future. Soon after, she was called the Narenboro Witch. 
She made a living off of predicting and sharing the future with others. Moving on to number two, we have Isabel Godi. Isabel Godi was a Scottish woman from Aldern, a village near the Scottish Highlands. She is well known in history because in 1662 she confessed to witchcraft and may have been executed. We actually don't know because there's no official record of it, so it's a mystery. Basically, during that time, if you were thought to be a witch, they would torture you until you admitted to being one, even if you weren't actually one. Well, Isabel's case sparked a lot of interest because she admitted to being a witch willingly without torture or anything. And she went into great detail on everything that she was doing. She gave four separate confessions given over a six week period. For example, she said she made a pact with the devil and had been engaging in intercourse with him. She also said that she was part of a coven and would cast spells on the community. She claimed she put a curse on some male authority figures who she felt victimized by. She also cursed her landlord for being a pervert and put one on the local church minister. Lastly, she also admitted that she had the ability to turn into animals and that she was interacting with fairies. Over the centuries, a number of people have analyzed Isabel and have come up with some explanations for her actions. One is that she suffered from psychosis or hallucinations, whereas others think it was a ploy to get maybe a more lenient sentence. But of course, you still have the people who believe that she was an actual witch and did everything that she admitted to doing. And in our number one spot today, we have La Voisine. Catherine Montvoisine or La Voisine was a witch that lived in France in the mid 1600s. Her witchcraft mainly comprised of mixing and creating potions, poisons, and medicines. She also would tell people their fortunes and would hold black masses where people could come and make contact with the devil through her. It started off with her just providing palm readings and advice for people. But then she realized that her clients were mainly women who were coming to her with spousal problems. A number of them wanted their husband dead. So she started creating the potions to help them kill their husbands and gain fortune. Then things started to get darker and darker. She began practicing dark magic and witchcraft. This involved her leading a number of satanic rituals in the catacombs under her home. One time she even spilt the blood of an innocent victim as a sacrifice for the devil. Eventually Catherine was arrested for practicing witchcraft and for being involved in a number of murders. She was publicly burned at the stake in 1680. Starting off this countdown we have Tatuba. Tatuba is a pretty famous name when it comes to the Salem witch trials because she was the first woman to be accused of practicing witchcraft. So Tatuba was a young slave who was under the order of a man named Samuel Paris. She was in charge of looking after his daughter and niece among other things. Then in the early 1690s, several young girls all over town began acting strange, his daughter and niece included. The girls would contort their bodies, bark like dogs, and babble and cry hysterically, almost as if they were possessed. They also would complain of bruises and pinch marks appearing randomly on their body. So immediately, people thought that they had been cursed by a witch. When she was put in front of a court, at first she denied any involvement. But eventually she admitted to practicing witchcraft. She claimed that the devil came to her and bid her to serve him. She went on to tell this elaborate tale about seeing strange animals, like a hairy creature that walked on two legs with wings and a head like a woman. She also talked about a red cat and how she would ride on sticks and was told by the devil to pinch these young girls. She also claimed that a big black dog came to her and told her to hurt the girls. Her testimony shocked and scared a lot of people. And we don't know if what she said was true or if she was just messing with the people in the court, you know, playing into the whole witch stereotype, or if she really was practicing witchcraft and made a deal with the devil. In the end, she was sent to prison for a year. In 1693, some mysterious unknown individual freed her from jail, and after that, no one heard from her. In our fourth spot today, we have Agnes Sampson. In the early 1590s, King James VI of Scotland started to fear witches. He blamed that witches could cast spells on Mother Nature and conjure up terrible storms. Well, as King James and his wife were sailing back to Scotland, they encountered two very dangerous storms. Immediately, he was like, it was the witches, they're out to get me. And then he was determined to get them. So he started a witch hunt. Of the 70 people accused of being witches, one of them was named Agnes Sampson. 
She was a healer and midwife, but because she had these healing powers, people automatically assumed that she was an evil witch. In fact, growing up, her father taught her about the black arts. She also apparently could give predictions. So yes, she was a witch, but she was not an evil one. Well, eventually she was accused by a woman named Gillis Duncan. Basically under torture, she confessed to being a witch and then gave the names of other witches. That's when Samson's name was brought up. She was then tortured as well and her body was shaved and revealed a witch's mark. In the end, under torture, she confessed to being allies with Satan and said that she conspired to kill the king. She was later burned to death. Now it's said that the ghost of Agnes haunts the palace of Holy Roadhouse. A number of people have seen her roaming around naked after she was stripped and tortured. Moving on to number three, we have Malin Matt's daughter. In July of 1676, Swedish widow Malin Matt's daughter was reported for being a witch. She was reported by her own daughters. They claimed that their mom would abduct a number of children and use them for a number of dark rituals. She was accused during the largest witch trial in Swedish history, the Great Noise. Now, was Malin actually a witch or were her daughters just looking to get rid of her? Well, sadly, we don't know for sure. She may have indeed been practicing witchcraft, but she wasn't going around abducting kids. That part was never proven. Anyways, when she was put in front of the court, she always maintained her innocence. Her partner, on the other hand, Anna Simon's daughter, Hack, was also accused of being a witch and apologized for her wrongdoings. These two women were the last victims executed for being witches. Anna was decapitated, but for Malin, well, they decided to burn her at the stake. She was the only witch in Swedish history to have been burned alive. Rumor has it that just before she was burned alive, she cursed both her daughters for eternity and gave them over to the devil. When the flames covered her body, apparently she did not scream, nor did she appear to be in pain. For everyone watching, this was further proof that she was in fact a witch. In our second spot today, we have Dion Fortune. Dion Fortune, born Violet Mary Firth, was a psychiatrist, author, occultist, and witch. For Fortune, it all started at the young age of four. That's when she claimed she started receiving visions. Apparently, the visions were of her being a priestess in her past life. Then at the age of 20, she suffered a mental breakdown as a result of these psychic attacks, as she called them. During her recovery, she found herself drawn to the occult. From there, she began writing a number of books on the occult and witchcraft. In 1924, she founded a fraternity for people interested in the craft. It was called the Fraternity of Inner Light. In the fraternity, they engaged in a number of different practices and rituals. One was the initiation ritual, where the candidate was introduced to magic and witchcraft. The second was evocation, in which people would learn to harness the powers of witchcraft. Furthermore, Fortune was known for her involvement in the magical battle of Britain. Basically, a number of British occultists joined together to help during World War II by using their magic. Shortly after the war ended, Fortune passed away. It's believed that her great effort in this battle caused her health to weaken and weaken. Nowadays, her influence is still strong for practitioners in the Wicca slash witchcraft movement. And in our number one spot today, we have Marie Laveau. Although Marie Laveau described herself as a voodoo priestess, a number of people just referred to her as a witch. So Marie lived in New Orleans from 1794 to 1881 but not a lot is known about her life. What we do know is that she turned heads on the streets. Some were terrified of her, others basically bowed down to her. So it's said that the magic she practiced combined Catholic and African spiritual traditions. In fact, she was frequently called upon to help others. She would visit the sick in prisons, and at one point, the city called upon her for help with the yellow fever epidemic of the 1850s. On top of it all, she owned a large snake that she named Zombie, named after an African god. In fact, many believe that this snake harnessed magical powers itself. Her most well-known case was when she was called to work on a murder trial of a young man. The man's father came to Marie and promised her anything if she just saved his son. The odds were not in his favor. Everyone for sure thought that the verdict was going to be guilty, but Marie secretly placed several charms throughout the courtroom. And guess what? In the end, the man was found not guilty. That's pretty freaky. After Marie's death, her gravesite was frequently vandalized, but not for what you think. 
That's because legend goes if you draw an X on her gravestone, Marie's spirit will grant you whatever you want. So you had to draw an X on her tomb, then turn around three times, knock on her tomb, and then you have to yell out your wish. If in the end the wish comes true, you have to come back, circle the X, and then leave Marie an offering. Here's another legend surrounding Miss Laveau. There's apparently a haunted image of her hanging in New Orleans Historic Voodoo Museum. Some people say that they can feel Marie's cold eyes watching them as they're looking at this painting. Others say that once you see this image, then Marie will haunt you and even show up in your dreams. In fact, tour guides say that whoever wishes to see this painting must go by themselves because the tour guides refuse to see this painting themselves. Pretty freaky if you ask me. Starting off this countdown, we have Gilles Garnet. Now, not only was this guy a witch, but he actually used his witchy powers to conjure up a potion that would transform him into a werewolf whenever he so pleased. That's right, he was a witch and a werewolf. In October of 1572 France, that's when Garnier killed his first victim as a werewolf. He grabbed the poor girl and dragged her into a vineyard. He then proceeded to tear the flesh off of her bones with his teeth and eat it. But he was still not satisfied after, so he went and ate another victim. He struck again the following month. He took on his werewolf form and attacked a man and ate his stomach. This kept going on and on until someone caught him. Well, actually, they didn't really know it was him at first, but they claimed that they saw some weird man like beast crouching over and eating one of the victims. That's when the authorities were like, oh shit, there's a werewolf on the loose and then they were out looking for this weird werewolf man. While they were out looking for him, people kept going missing like crazy and eventually he was caught. One evening a group of workers were traveling across towns when they spotted the werewolf man. As they got closer, they saw it was Garnier and obviously reported his ass to the authorities. <laughs> At trial, he confessed to having stalked and murdered at least four individuals, but the number was indeed higher. In the end, he was found guilty of witchcraft and lycanthropy, and he was burned at the stake. Moving on to number four, we have Lassus Brigida. Lassus Brigida was an alleged Swedish witch back in the 1500s. In fact, she was the first woman executed for witchcraft in Sweden. Story goes that one night, her and two men met up at a churchyard cemetery with plans to resurrect people from the dead using their witchy powers. When they arrived at the church, Lassus used her powers to open the church doors. This involved her circling the place three times and then blowing into the keyhole. Magically it opened for them and they entered. While in the church they were looking for a stole. You know, the scarf type pieces of cloth that are worn by priests. That was needed in order to complete the ritual. After finally finding it, she renounced God and swore herself to the devil. Somehow, people found out that the three had attempted to resurrect the dead and reported them. Lassus was decapitated for being a witch, whereas the other two men were just fined. That's rough, man. That's rough. I'm also glad that their plan to bring back the dead didn't work. Like, imagine they would have to fight off witches and then zombies. Crazy. Coming in at number three, we have Agnes Waterhouse. Agnes Waterhouse, otherwise known as Mother Waterhouse, was the first woman in England to be executed for witchcraft. Agnes confessed to being a witch and having a familiar named Satan, which was her cat. Later on, the cat apparently took the form of a toad. The familiar originally belonged to her friend and fellow witch, Elizabeth Francis, but was later passed along to her. Furthermore, apparently Agnes would use her sorcery for evil. In 1566, she used her witchcraft to try and cause illness to a man named William Fine, and he was not so fine. After that, she used her powers to kill her enemy's livestock and as well as cause them illness. And lastly, she also tried to kill her husband using her powers. In fact, at her trial, one of her neighbors, a 12-year-old girl named Agnes Brown, came forward and testified against her. She claimed that she was visited by a demon dog under the control of Agnes Waterhouse. So according to the girl, one day she was visited by this demon that looked like a black dog with a face of an ape with a short tail, a set of horns, and a silver whistle around its neck. The demon dog appeared at her home and asked for some butter. She refused and apparently later that day he returned with a knife and threatened to kill her. She said that he said that he was going to thrust his knife in her heart and kill her. When the girl bravely asked to send him, the dog just turned his head toward Waterhouse's home. On July 29th, 1566, Agnes Waterhouse was executed. Before doing so, she repented and begged God for forgiveness. She also did admit that she was sending her familiar to her 
hurt and damage her neighbor's goods. But her neighbor, a tailor named Wardall, had such strong faith that the familiar was unable to mess with him. In the end, Agnes was hanged for her crimes. Moving on to number two, we have Elizabeth Francis. So Elizabeth Francis was friends with Agnes Waterhouse. Some even say that they were sisters. I don't know. But she was accused around the same time that Agnes was. She was the original owner of Satan, the white spotted cat and her familiar. According to Francis, she received the cat from her grandmother who was also a witch. Her grandmother, in fact, was the person who taught her all about witchcraft when she was only 12 years old. According to Elizabeth, her cat would speak to her in a strange hollow voice and also would do anything in exchange for a drop of blood, which is why they could get him to do all of their dark bidding for them. During trial, Elizabeth confessed to stealing sheep and killing a number of people, including a man named Andrew Biles. Andrew refused to marry Elizabeth after she became pregnant with his child, so she killed him. Later on, her familiar told her to make a certain concoction of herbs and to drink it and that that would terminate her pregnancy. She did, and it worked. Not only that, but when Frances finally married, she got her familiar to kill her husband and her daughter. Agnes also confessed to using her powers and familiar to kill one of her own pigs to see, you know, what it could do. And then she also killed her neighbor's cows and geese after they got in an argument. She got in an argument with the neighbor, not with the cows and geese, thought I should clarify. As I said before, the cat eventually turned to a toad on its own. So Frances was the first witch to be accused and then she was the one who told everyone about Agnes in order to get a lighter sentence. So Elizabeth wasn't killed right off the bat. But 13 years later, she was accused again, and that's when she was killed for witchcraft. And in our number one spot today, we have Lori Cabot. The story of Lori Cabot is one that still blows my mind to this day. So Lori is the high priestess of the Salem Coven. She is well known among modern day witches. Now Lori would only ever use her powers for good and to help people. In fact, she was psychic and she would use her psychic abilities in order to help police solve a number of crimes. The first time being during the disappearance and death of Martha Brailsford. So back in 1991, two people from Salem were reported missing. That was Martha Brailsford and her neighbor Tom Mamoni. Eventually Tom returned home and said that the two were sailing when Martha fell off the boat after being hit by a rogue wave. So police began searching the bay for Martha, but they were unsuccessful. That's when one of the investigators who knew about Lori and her abilities reached out to her for her help. Using just Martha's name, location and birth, she was able to tune in and locate her. Lori then said she got visions of Tom trying to make advances on Martha, but Martha was not into it. When she rejected him, he dragged her to the side of the boat and struck her head. He then put weights on her hips and attached an anchor to her feet and tossed her overboard. She even saw exactly where in the water Martha was. And guess what? She was right about all of that. A local fisherman ended up finding her body in the location that Lori had said. And Martha did indeed have anchors and weights attached to her body. When Martha's body was located, Tom fled. And so Lori was once again asked for help, but this time locating Tom. She once again tuned in and got a vision of Tom in a cabin, and got a vibe he was on his way to cross into Canada. Not only that, but Lori performed a binding spell on Tom to make sure he would do something stupid so that he would get caught. Well, three days later, police found the cabin Tom was staying in, and it was in a small town near the Canadian border. They found the cabin because Tom made a stupid mistake. He parked his car near the cabin and he left the lights on. Neighbors called the cops because they didn't recognize the car and they knew the neighbors were out of town. Isn't that crazy? Round of applause for Lori. Number five on this list is what I'm going to be nicknaming the Scottish Witch from the Woods. I stumbled across a Scottish story about a witch where they were unable to discover her name. Hundreds of years ago, when Scotland was still being first developed, there was a village in the north of the country. This village was positioned directly next to a forest that they wanted to chop down and expand into. When they began their process of chopping down the forest, a witch, or the Witch of the Woods, came out and warned them that if they continued, she would curse their entire community. The woman would become infertile. The crops would never grow and people would go missing. Fearing for their safety, the group came to an agreement with this witch, where they were allowed to chop down a small section of the forest in exchange for leaving one sack every harvest of grain or produce by the edge of the forest. 
This agreement held true for quite a while until the community started to get less fearful and more greedy. They decided to go against this witch and chop down the rest of the forest without fear of consequence. When the witch came out of the forest again to address their betrayal, they refused to listen and they hung her immediately. Right before she was executed though, she said that the new price was three bags of grain. This fell on deaf ears though except for one fearful farmer that decided to heed the warning for a little while. The community went on thriving until one once again, that farmer's fear was replaced with greed. He stopped delivering the grain, and that very same day, his youngest daughter went missing. The community looked everywhere, but nobody could find her until somebody checked the mill. Through the bricks and all over the walls, blood started dripping down to the ground, and they knew exactly where his daughter went. That mill has since been torn down, but it was replaced with a silo. And to this day, the locals in that area still think that that silo is haunted by the Scottish Witch in the Woods. Number 4 on this list goes to the Paisley Witches. The Paisley Witches are actually nicknamed after the town of Paisley in Scotland where these witches were based. Christian Shaw was an 11 year old girl who was the daughter of a higher up in the Scottish community. It was this 11 year old girl who fell victim to the curse of several witches. It started with a deep sickness that manufactured itself like any other, fevers, chills, exhaustion. But some reports say that it became much more than that. The story goes that Shaw on one occasion levitated from her bed and on another occasion started chanting some deep curse. It was clear to everybody involved, including Shaw, that some form of Scottish witchcraft was a foot. Now she made it evident that she believed multiple witches were involved in causing her ailment, seven of them in fact. A trial was held for these witches where it was discovered that they all had the witches mark or the devils mark as some like to call it on their bodies. After this evidence came to light, the jury's decision was easy and all of the witches were sentenced to death. Now this story was a long time ago and it's hard to know for certain whether these individuals had anything to do with Shaw's ailment and witchcraft or if they were wrongly accused, tried in properly and the story has been exaggerated over time, which frankly is not unlike other potential witch stories during this period. The only thing that we can say for certain though is that the people back then and the 11 year old Christian Shaw believed wholeheartedly that this group of Paisley witches was just that, witches. Number 3 on this list is Helen Duncan. Helen Duncan was a Scottish witch who traveled throughout Europe and actually isn't that far removed from present day. She died in 1956 and is known by some to be the last Scottish witch. As a young girl, she was considered by most to be a normal, albeit outspoken and loud, growing child. It wasn't until midway through her life that she started seriously practicing witchcraft. Helen garnered a name for herself by regularly performing seances every evening and having the ability to communicate with the dead. During her nightly rituals, she would invite viewers to come and watch. These viewers had reported seeing the materialization of ghostly figures directly in front of their eyes when Helen entered her deep, witchly trance. Helen was also capable of and would often excrete a strange looking ectoplasm from her mouth while she was doing this. And if this wasn't enough, Duncan could also see things that others couldn't. At one point, the ghost of a sailor appeared and talked about a very secretive incident that had happened in World War II that the public or Helen Duncan couldn't have possibly known about. After hearing this information, the authorities realized that they couldn't have Duncan revealing any important state secrets about the war and arrested her for witchcraft immediately. It was revealed during her trial that some of her witchy ways were not what people were led to believe though. Like her ectoplasm was simply the regurgitation of a cheesecloth made to look like some type of ghostly substance. Even though some of her abilities were proven to be fraudulent, it still doesn't explain how she was able to accurately predict or say the things that she couldn't have possibly known. Helen Duncan didn't use any of her abilities to harm anyone, but the capability to potentially talk to the dead it's still very chilling. Number two on this list is Thomas Weir and his sister Grizel. What makes Thomas and his sister so scary is that nobody expected them to be involved in witchcraft at all. Up until the end of his life, Thomas was known by most to be a nice man of the community held in high esteem. However, nearing the end of his life, Thomas came clean about who he really was, telling the entire community during a religious service that he and his sister had been performing witchcraft for years. Going into deep detail about how they had consistent communication with the devil and had devoted their entire lives to carrying out his bidding. This bidding manifested itself in many different ways, most of which involved causing harm to others or in Thomas's case, getting it on with animals. Yeah. He was a weird dude. At first the community barely believed him, but after the sister came out and corroborated his story in detail as well, they started piecing it together. 
Thomas was always walking around with a big black staff. The neighbors had reported hearing strange sounds in the evening coming from their home and weird lights going off. Suddenly the guy that everybody thought they knew as their nice friendly neighbor was somebody else entirely. Reports say that when he was burned at the stake, he took far longer to die than a human should. Also his staff was burned with him and it emitted an extremely strange sound and moved in unnatural directions when it was burning as if it was being possessed by some force. I suppose that in the case of Thomas and Grizel, they had done such a good job at hiding their identities as witches and had been extremely methodical with their crimes that before they died, they just had to let the world know just how evil they actually were. Number one on this list is Isabel Gowdy. Isabel was a Scottish witch from the 1600s and frankly, she did everything. Through several confessions that she made on her own accord, without the pressure of torture or coercion from higher ups. Isabel admitted to taking part in a wide array of witchcraft activities. She admitted that she had freely let the devil suck blood from her neck and that she had romantic relationships with the devil before. She admitted to taking the body out of child's graves and using it in a ritual to destroy people's crops. She said that she had made clay effigies or voodoo dolls of someone's children and used these to harm and even kill them. Isabel was also part of a coven, a group of witches whose intentions were evil and had the ability to change their form into animals. She described in detail the brutal murders that she had committed for the devil and her fellow witches. She even offered up information about spells they had used to inflict illnesses on people, uttering some of them to the council she was confessing to. Now it's unclear exactly why Isabel decided to confess to these heinous crimes and oust herself as being a witch. She had to be aware that confessing to these crimes of this nature would surely mean her execution. It had been said though that she felt extreme guilt for her crimes and that's why she decided to come forward and accept the consequences as they were. Regardless of what her intentions were though, Isabel Gowdy has to go down as one of the most dangerous known witches in Scottish history. Starting off this countdown we have the North Berwick Witches. North Berwick is a small town in Scotland where some of the most brutal and horrific witch trials took place. It all started during the reign of King James VI. While on his way to get his new bride in 1589, he encountered a series of disastrous storms. In fact, the storms were so bad that he was forced to head back home. He immediately thought that the storms were the work of witches. It didn't help that back then a rumor had started that a witch had sailed out on the river forth to conjure up some storms. So from then on, King James was dead set on finding these witches. In fact, 70 to 200 women were accused of being witches. Most of them were tortured and then executed. Now apparently during these trials, he did come across a number of women that admitted to being witches. They claimed that they had all made deals with the devil and were now under his command. They also claimed that they would use one of the churches there to hold their covens. They even said that this was the place where they had summoned the devil himself. In fact, this church was located right on the seafront, so James was like, aha! the perfect place to conjure up storms. All of you are guilty. As a result, these witches were strangled and then burnt at the stake. In our fourth spot today, we have Sabrina Spellman. Although she's a fictional character, Sabrina still deserves a spot on today's list. Without too many spoilers, the show The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina is about Sabrina, a teenage witch who on her 16th birthday has to sign her name in the Book of the Beast. Upon doing so, she makes a deal with Satan. She basically gives herself to him in exchange for magical powers. At first, Sabrina refused to do so because she didn't want to give up her mortal life. But later on, she was forced into doing it in order to stop a number of evil forces that were murdering many of the townsfolk. Once she signed the book, she is forced to do Satan's bidding. She has to basically bow down to him and do whatever he instructs her to do. In return, Sabrina's magic became even stronger. In fact, she became the fourth witch in all of history to summon demonic blue hellfire, which was then used in order to fight off the Greendale 13. And for her to do that as a relatively new witch, is very impressive. Later on in the show, we also realize that Miss Wardwell is evil and is using Sabrina so she can become the Queen of Hell. Sabrina's destiny took a dark shift as soon as she made a deal with the Dark Lord. Although all the witches in the series have signed this book, the Dark Lord specifically needed Sabrina to sign it. Her destiny is far more different than the other witches in the show. Have you guys watched the show? Let me know in the comments below. Honestly, I did, but after season two, I just, I couldn't anymore. Let me know your thoughts though. Moving on at number three, we have 
have Lilith. Now, the description of Lilith varies depending on your beliefs. In Jewish folklore, Lilith is a female demon. In Luciferian witchcraft and Luciferism, Lilith is described as the consort of Samael. Other people believe that she is the wife of Satan or that Lilith was the first wife of Adam. But she wasn't that obedient to him and Adam didn't like that, so Lilith left. Then God made Eve who was more obedient. Lilith became jealous and turned into the snake that made Eve take a bite from the apple. The two were banished from the Garden of Eden and Lilith turned into a demon. Her main goal? To get revenge on all men. Then you have the people that believe Lilith is a child killing witch. She wasn't able to conceive so she was jealous of pregnant women and would go around killing them or stealing their babies. In this case, we are looking at the version in which Lilith is a witch. Obviously. In this case, Lilith is working alongside Satan to do his dark bidding for him. Their deal is that if she's with him, then she will work for him. But she's not always obedient, in fact she has gotten frisky with other men. In the TV series Supernatural, Lilith is depicted as a white eyed powerful demon. She is said to be the first human that made a deal with Satan and promised to serve him. As a result, she became the first demon. In the chilling adventures of Sabrina, we end up finding out that one of the characters, Miss Wardwall, is actually Lilith. She is referred to as Satan's concubine and the mother of demons, and of course, she's a witch. In fact, she is said to be the first witch in existence. She made a deal with Satan or the Dark Lord. According to her story, she was wandering the wasteland aimlessly when she encountered Lucifer the fallen angel. She made a deal to heal the wounds caused by the loss of his wings, if he in return helped her. She then pledged allegiance to him and became his handmaiden. In the end, Lilith wants to become his queen, which is why she goes to the extreme lengths to do whatever he tells her to do. Moving on to number two, we have Sarah Good. Now, if you have seen the Fear Street trilogy on Netflix, then chances are you might be a little familiar with this story. The movie was loosely based off of the real witch, Sarah Good, but in the movie, they changed her name to Sarah Fear. So, Sarah was one of the first three women that were accused of witchcraft. It was her, Sarah Osborne, and Tachuba. These two other ladies were said to be real witches, and when they were accused, they brought forth Sarah Good's name, saying that she was was a witch too, little tattletailers. The townspeople were quick to believe this because Sarah never attended church. She lacked self discipline and self control, and she was 38, but apparently she looked like she was 70. That combined with the other ladies' testimonies had everyone against her. In fact, apparently when she was brought in front of the court, a number of witnesses began to twitch and rock back and forth and moan. So they were all like, damn, she's definitely a witch. Look at what she's doing to the people that accused her of being one. Not only that, but her own husband and daughter even admitted to Sarah being a witch as well. And then things kept getting worse and worse for her. At one point in her trial, one of the accusers started acting out and claimed that Sarah attacked her with a knife. In the end, of course, she was found guilty of witchcraft and was sentenced to death. But just before her death, she made a deal with the devil to curse a priest. She said, and I quote, I am no more a witch than you are a wizard, and if you take my life, God will give you blood to drink. Now when she died, apparently the priest and his land both became Came cursed, just like Sarah claimed it would. To this day, it's said that Sarah continues to haunt the town, searching for those that have wronged her. And in our number one spot today, we have the Bonus Witches. In 1679, in Bonus, Scotland, a number of women were accused of being witches. These women were Annabelle Thompson, Margaret Pringle, Margaret Hamilton, Bessie Yicker, and another woman named Margaret Hamilton. Now, during this time, the hype and fear of witches was dying down. So people were shocked that out of nowhere, five women were being accused. But Rumor has it these women had renounced their baptisms and had been in contact with the devil on a number of occasions. They apparently had eaten, drank, danced, and had intercourse with the devil. Annabelle Thompson even admitted that she had made a deal with the devil for a better life. She had been widowed twice, and so she turned to the devil for help, and in return, she would be loyal to him. She then invited the other women to come over and do all these things with the devil with her. The women then apparently formed a demonic pact with each other and Satan. One of the Margaret Hamilton also admitted that she had met the devil. She claimed that the devil came to her in the form of a black dog. And she said that she was his servant for three decades already. And another was accused of using her witch magic to help get wealth. As a result, all the witches were found guilty and were strangled at the stake before being burned to ash. Coming in at number five, we have Baba Yaga. In Slavic folklore, Baba Yaga is a witch who appears as a deformed or ferocious looking old woman. In Slavic culture, Baba Yaga lived in a hut usually described as standing on chicken legs. Baba Yaga may help or hinder those that encounter or seek her out. If she decided that she does not like you or wants to help your cause, you 
would meet a violent end. Baba is an ogress who steals, cooks, and eats her victims, usually children. She once lived in a hut surrounded by human skulls and a spike as to warn off those who might try to approach her. She was banished from the living realm due to her horrible acts. It is said that now and then she is summoned, and when this happens, she wreaks havoc on children, taking more victims. Please don't ever attempt to summon Baba Yaga for favor, although she may decide to help if she chooses. But be warned, it may be the last thing you ever do. Coming in at number four, we have Malin Matz. Daughter. Malin is a Swedish witch accused during the witch hunt of 1668 to 76. She was a widow and was also accused of being involved in her late husband's passing. Her main accusation was from the children of her village. They claimed that she had been abducting them and bringing them to a secluded place to perform a satanic sabbath. Reportedly, she was trying to persuade the children to join her in performing black magic. She was even accused by her own daughters, persuading the court of her guilt. Malin, along with Anna Hack were the last victims executed for being witches during the Great Swedish Witch Hunt of 1668 to 76 often referred to as the Great Noise. What makes Malin Matsdotter unique is that she's considered the only witch in Swedish history to have been burned alive. Normally witches were decapitated or hanged before their bodies were burned at the stake. But it appears Malin's refusal to admit to her guilt made the authorities less gracious in their sentencing. Malin firmly maintained her innocence and went out in history. In the end, she refused to shake hands with her daughters. It is said that before her death she gave her daughters to the devil and cursed them for eternity for their part in her sentencing. While burning, Malin did not scream, she did not cry or react to her pain. Some felt this further confirmed her witchcraft. Shortly after her death, one of her daughters was convicted of perjury and she too was forced to walk through death's door. It is now said that if you try to summon Malin, you too will be cursed for eternity like the daughter. She is angry and looking for revenge. You might stand a chance if you are not a woman as she directs her curses at any woman who crosses her path, as if they are her daughters. But just to be safe, maybe don't try to contact her next time you're near a Ouija board. Coming in at number three, we have Pester. Pesta is the witch of pestilence and disease. When she roamed the land of the living, she was known for bringing great disease that killed thousands. It is said she was born during a great plague. From the destruction she was created to ensure this suffering continued around the world. She is a hideous old woman dressed in black, carrying a rake or a broom. She travelled from farm to farm spreading disease. If she carried a rake, some at the farm would die. But if she carried a broom, all at the farm would die. The Black Plague was first brought to the northern countries via a ghost ship. In 1349, a ship carrying wool set forth from England headed north, but before the ship reached its destination, one by one, they started to get sick and die. Any attempts to quarantine the sick failed. The ship should have sunk or stayed lost at sea, but it is believed that Pesta guided the ship to shore and it reached Bergen Harbour in Norway. I've been there. Rats and fleas on board which carried the plague made their way into the country. The Black Death then spread to Sweden and then into Russia in 1351. This plague was so deadly it killed a third of Denmark's population and half of the people in Norway. It is said that if you did try to summon her, she would bring with her a great plague. Maybe someone was messing around with her in December of 2019. If so, please never do that again. Coming in at number two, we have Vet. Vet, also known as Mare, is a young woman who would bring bad dreams to people by sitting on them while they slept. She causes sleep paralysis in her victims. Mare often appears in Germanic folklore. She takes many different shapes and sizes. The tale of the Mare might be connected to old hag syndrome. You wake up and you can't move. You feel an immense amount of pressure on your chest that makes it difficult to breathe. And you can sense or see someone is in the room with you. It can be a frightening experience. For years, people have taken this experience as a physical encounter with a ghost because when it happens, you are fully awake. You can see, hear, smell, and feel. So it feels like someone or something is holding you down. In essence, you are paralyzed. As well as this, when a person wakes too quickly, hallucinations can occur. This explains the smaller percentage of people who report seeing vet rather than being paralyzed by her. Vet has a good connection with the mortal world. Some say she has somehow found a way to invade our nightmares, as this is when we are most vulnerable. It does not take much to invite her into your mind, so you need to be careful to not think or speak of Vet. Her attack is terrifying, as there is nothing you can do once she has her hands on you. 
Once she has you, she can hold onto your mind for years, so avoid her at all costs. And finally, in at number one, we have Sarah Good. Sarah Good is world famous for being the first witch to be killed in the Salem witch trials. It all started on March 1st, 1692, when Sarah Good was charged with witchcraft along with Sarah Osborne and Tituba. Sarah Good was an easy target for witchcraft. She was a beggar, almost at the very bottom of the social ladder. When Sarah Good was charged, she was a complete wreck. Because of all the stress when she was charged at the age of 38, she looked as if she was 70 years old. To top it all off, she was pregnant and also had a four and a half year old daughter named Dorcas Good. She gave birth to the infant she was pregnant with in jail. Sarah Good's trial was not successful. The verdict was decided before the trial. She was a witch. Many people testified against Sarah Good, including her husband and her daughter, Dorcas Good. During her trial, she said that she was muttering psalms to herself. Unfortunately, she could not come up with any of the psalms during the trial, something that was too much of a coincidence. She also never attended church. Even the most trusting congregationalists would find that a bit odd. In court, Sarah said that she did not attend church because she did not have clothes good enough for church. Unsurprisingly, she was found guilty, and because she refused to confess, she was sentenced to death. She stayed in jail until July 19th, 1692, when she was executed. Just before her execution, she was asked to confess. She refused. Instead, she cursed the people, saying, I'm no more a witch than you are a wizard, and if you take away my life, God will give you blood to drink. It is said that she cursed the land, and a terrible fate followed those responsible for her death. It is said that those who have tried to summon her over the years have been cursed to either have dreadful luck in their life or meet a tragic end. Coming in at number five, we have Holder. Holder is a witch who is rumored to live deep within the forest, secluded from the rest of the world. It is said that if you get lost in the woods, it is usually due to the influence of Holder's magic. She influences children to wander off on their own so that she may trap them. She has also been known to offer magical favors to children who find her. She just requests in return they visit her again with their friends or siblings. Once Holder has captured and trapped the children, she will cook and consume them, leaving no evidence behind that they were ever there. If she doesn't eat the children herself, she will serve them to the next children who find her home as a sick punishment. It is believed that Holder once had a daughter. The daughter was evil and was using dark magic to hurt people, including the rest of Holder's family. When Holder lost everyone who she cared for, she destroyed her daughter to make sure she could never hurt anyone again. Since then, she has spent her days luring children to her and destroying them as she did her own daughter. So don't wander off if you are ever walking in the woods and absolutely do not summon Holder, or you might notice kids going missing around your neighborhood. Coming in at number four, we have Agatha Harkness. Agatha is one of the original witches from Salem, though she was not caught. She started as one of the lower witches of her coven, but quickly rose in the ranks amongst her fellow witches. It is said that she practices dark magic. Her mother was once one of the greatest witches. She was confronted by the rest of her coven for practicing dark magic, something that was not allowed. They attempted to destroy her for her crimes, but they did not realize how strong her power was. They attempted to destroy her for her crimes, but they did not realize how strong her power was. She drained the power from every other witch in the coven, including her mother, making her the most powerful witch in Salem. It is said that since then, she has continued to practice her dark magic, never encountering a witch as powerful or as cunning as she is. She is an evil witch who can manipulate the minds of those around her to commit horrible acts. She is not someone who you would like to cross or make angry. She also has the ability to wipe the memories of those who she controls, meaning they don't even know that it was not their decision to commit their crimes. It is said she still resides in Salem, where her coven once called home. Although it is not clear where, there are a number of historical sites in Salem one could visit if looking for Agatha. If you did want to contact her for some dark reason, it does not come easy. You have to make a sacrifice for her to bother making an appearance. She requires a personal sacrifice of something that you love, whatever that may be for you. Maybe burning your childhood toy or something else you were attached to emotionally. If you do summon her, you might not get what you wanted. If she likes you, she might grant whatever you seek, but if not, you might unleash a great evil not only on yourself, but back onto the world. I think it would be best for everyone that we leave Agatha to whatever realm she is currently hiding in. Come in at number three, Lyorona. 
Is she just a legend, a ghost, or maybe a witch? Some believe La Llorona to be a powerful witch. How else would she have remained so strong in the mortal realm after her death and able to trap so many victims? The story of La Llorona is that long ago a woman named Maria married a rich man with whom she eventually had two children. Then their marriage hit a rough patch, her husband spent less and less time at home, and whenever he was home he paid attention only to the children. Eventually she sees him with another woman. Enraged beyond reason, some versions Clay Maria drowned her two children, but she immediately regretted it, crying out, Oh my children! Maria is sometimes said to have drowned herself afterwards. However, not everyone believes that she did drown herself. Some say her rage sent her deep into seclusion, where she turned mad and began studying dark magic. She wanted revenge from what her husband had done to her, but she got lost in her grief and rage and forgot her original reason. All she could think of now was her children and the anger she felt. Now she roams the earth looking to steal children from their mothers. Children are warned not to go out in the dark, for La Llorona might snatch them, throwing them to their deaths in the flowing waters. There is one warning if La Llorona is stalking you as one of her next victims. You will hear her crying. Once you hear this, there is little that can be done to stop her. If you were to summon her, she would not benefit you in any way. There is no bargain you could strike with her. She only knows pain and destruction. Coming in at number 2, we have Sally the Dunstable Witch. The story of Sally came from the late 19th century, about an elderly woman who lived in Dunstable, Bedford. She was allegedly a little old lady living alone with her cat. When perhaps out of boredom or being fed up with her life, she turned to the dark arts. Allegedly, the town found out about her practicing dark magic. They stormed her house and pulled her into the town square. They proceeded to burn her at the stake. But Sally had planned for this. Somehow, she found a way to survive the burning and took a new form. As she burned, she cursed the village and promised to get revenge. On her return, she was plaguing the church, performing her magic to make the village believe the devil was among them. Scared, they called in an exorcist. He discovered Sally and her magic. It is said that he backed her into a corner and was able to trap her. Once trapped, they buried her in the graveyard. It is said that they gave her grave a peephole, as they always wanted to tell that she was still in there. The townspeople were terrified she would once again return to terrorize them. She is still used as a tale to this day to get the children to behave, saying if they didn't, she might return. Maybe if you found her grave, you could peer in to see if she is still trapped. Or maybe she is already a escaped. And finally in at number 1 we have Guajona. The Guajona is a creature in Canterburyan legend, resembling a disfigured human female. She is thought to resemble one of the many forms of witches and hags of medieval Europe. She is covered from head to toe in an old thin black cloak. Her hands and feet are gnarled bird legs, her face is yellow and consumed by rough and hairy warts. Her eyes are tiny and bright as stars. Her quillen nose and mouth contain a single black razor sharp teeth, which extends long enough to be under her chin and used to suck blood. The creature only appears at night. It is unknown where she is meant to sleep during the day, although it is suspected to be hiding underground. Guahona invades homes without getting noticed and walks silently towards healthy young children to suck their blood in their sleep by sticking a tooth into their veins. She does not kill them, but instead leaving them almost bloodless, so when they wake up in the morning, they will be tired, pale, and discolored. So looking like me. Guaona also attacks adults. Why do all witches seem to hate children? It seems if you summon any of these witches, you will be putting children in danger. Being drained of all your blood does not sound like a nice way to die. Coming in at number 5, we have Frau Perchta. This is a terrifying Christmas witch. Christmas is usually a time of togetherness, happiness, celebrations, and lots of food, right? Well, in Austrian and Bavarian tradition, people have a little bit more to fear. Everyone has heard of Krampus, the half goat, half demon that punishes misbehaved children at Christmas. But few have heard of the ruthless Frau Perchta. This old hag is not to be underestimated. Perchta is often depicted as a crone with an iron beaked nose dressed in rags and sometimes carrying a cane. The other thing she carries is a bit more sinister, a massive knife hidden under her skirt. And she certainly loves to use it. You don't get the nickname Belly Slicer for no reason. Legends say that the witch punishes bad children and rewards the good. Sounds a bit like Santa Claus, however a lump of coal sure beats what her punishment entails. Frau Percher apparently hates children who are dishonest and will scrape their tongues if they lie. Unfortunately being an adult won't save you from the Christmas witch. Frau Perchta 
has a thing about domestic cleanliness and will punish women if their homes aren't clean enough. Ladies also feel her wrath if they leave their flax unspun, but the punishment doesn't seem to fit the crime. By the 12th night or January 6th, if your home is messy, your flax left unspun and you didn't leave out a bowl of porridge for her, Frau Perchta will slice open your belly with her long knife, remove your organs and fill your insides with rocks and straw. So if you want to avoid being disemboweled by Frau Perchta, maybe skip out on summoning her this Christmas. Coming in at number 4 we have Isabel Gowdy. Isabel Gowdy is a Scottish woman made famous for her extremely detailed confession of witchcraft in 1662. Unlike many other women at the time, she was not tortured for her testimony and willingly gave it on her own volition. Her confession apparently provides one of the more comprehensive looks into European witchcraft folklore at the end of the era of witch hunts. As a result, she was tried and allegedly executed. In her famous confessions that took place over several weeks, Isabel Gowdy spoke about the time she encountered the devil, who she described as having cloven hoofed feet. She admitted to being in service to the devil, also claiming to have slept with him. Gowdy spoke in great detail about her coven's activities, like their abilities to shapeshift into animals. She detailed the different charms and chants she would use and also said she was once entertained by the queen of fairies in her home. The details surrounding her execution are muddied at best. There's speculation that she was strangled and burned, while others say she was most likely beheaded. Coming in at number 3 we have Jenny Greenteeth. Straight from English folklore is Jenny Greenteeth, a bit of a party city looking witch if you ask me, but she's not someone to cross. This witch has a myriad of different names like Wicked Jenny or Jenny Greenteeth, but her MO is all the same. The water dwelling hag is said to have an affinity for drowning the vulnerable. This legendary witch has a bit of a monstrous appearance with long arms, sharp teeth and wild hair. Her skin is a grotesque shade of green and resembles duckweed, a type of weed that is one of Britain's most common small water plants. Because of this she's often associated with ponds and rivers with the weed growing on it and it's said to be an indicator of her presence. From the 19th century onwards children have been warned to steer clear from bodies of water with the threat of Jenny Greenteeth drowning them. It was also said that if they stuck around a pond too long, her long arms would drag them into the water. Elderly folks will also suffer the same fate should they not listen to the warnings. Fun fact, Jenny Greenteeth actually inspired Meg Mucklebones in Ridley Scott's Legend. In at number 2 we have Mole Dyer. Mole Dyer has a bit of a tragic backstory, but her legend still runs strong in the community in which she lived. In 17th century Leonardtown, Maryland, Mole Dyer was an old woman who was accused of witchcraft and ultimately suffered a fate similar to those of the Salem witch trials. Although historical records have yet to prove her existence, there were several dyers in the area at the time, so it's possible that Mole was simply a nickname. And despite this, there's a street, a stream, and a large rock named after this alleged witch. Legend goes that Mole Dye was an old hag who lived a semi isolated life on the edge of town. The townspeople feared her, and the ambiguity of her origin sparked a flurry of rumours. Some believed that she had killed her husband and was on the run, and others believed she was driven out of her previous hometown. There was speculation that she was a healer, and after a series of misfortunes plagued the town, Mole Dye was blamed and labelled as a witch. On a freezing winter night, the townspeople gathered outside of her home with torches and pitchforks in tow, setting fire to the ramshackle home. Moldai narrowly escaped the angry mob and took off deeper into the woods. Several days later, her body was discovered frozen solid on top of a large boulder, with one hand stretched out to the heavens as if cursing her tormentors. In the years after her passing, they say that the lands became uncharacteristically barren, livestock died, and the men responsible for leading the mob suffered bouts of terrible luck. Today, Moldai is said to haunt the lands in which she died and can be found on the coldest of winter nights. The imprint of her body is apparently still embedded on the rock that she died on and is even on display in the town. Many believe that Moldai partially served as an inspiration for the entity from the Blair Witch Project. We all know how that ends, so I would not recommend summoning Moldai. And finally, in at number one, we have the Bell Witch. In the top spot is none other than the infamous Bell Witch. The legend of the Bell Witch haunting is a staple in southern United States folklore and a terrifying story at that, so terrifying that he even captured the attention of a US president. In the early 1800s, John Bell and his family settled in Tennessee on 320 acres of farmland along the Red River. For their first 10 years their life was good until one day things changed. Strange paranormal occurrences began to plague the family. They would hear pounding on the walls, chains rattling, and John Bell even saw a peculiar and unnatural looking creature. It had the head of a rabbit and the body of a dog. The haunting 
progressed and soon the entity was snatching blankets off of the children as they slept and even began to develop a voice. The family would hear faint whisperings and what sounded like an old woman singing hymns. The activity only got worse and the entity began attacking the Bell's youngest daughter, Betsy Bell, leaving welts and handprints all over her face and body. Its voice strengthened over time and they would hear it quoting scripture, carrying on intelligent conversations and still singing hymns. Word of the supernatural phenomena spread like wildfire and even garnered the attention of Andrew Jackson before he became the 7th President of the United States. When Jackson and his men went to investigate the claims, one man from his entourage was allegedly attacked by the Bell Witch and said he felt pins being stabbed into him and was being beaten severely. Some alleged that Jackson later said that he would rather fight the British at New Orleans than fight the Bell Witch. Maybe for good reason too, because John Bell became the main subject of her wrath. The Bell Witch apparently tormented him and caused a steep decline in his health. John Bell eventually died and the witch took responsibility, claiming she had poisoned him. The Bell Witch is said to still haunt the property today and is regarded as one of the most famous pieces of southern lore. Starting off this countdown, we have the West Branch Witch. This witch is pretty famous in Ohio. So legend goes that there is this witch that many people have encountered in West Branch State Park. This witch tends to dress head to toe in all black. The first appearance was reported in 1960 by a man named B.A. Evans. He recently purchased a piece of land and later discovered a small cemetery on it. The cemetery contained seven gravestones surrounded by a 40 inch wall. The gravestones are apparently from a family named the Elliots. Now, the headstone that gets the most attention is that of Clemenza. Clemenza was apparently killed by a group of townspeople after being accused of being a witch. As a result, she was pressed to death. A wooden board was placed on her, and then on top was piled with stones until, you know, her body was crushed by the weight. To this day, her grave is marked by a pile of stones that rests on top of it. Now it's said that she haunts the graveyard and the surrounding area. In fact, on her graveyard is a curse that says, and I quote, Remember youth as you pass by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so must you be. Prepare for death and follow me. Now, if you read it out loud by her grave, she will apparently chase you away. Apparently, this whole legend is real though, and there is a curse upon her grave. One night, a group of hooligans took stones from her grave, which, hello, you're not supposed to do. Well, on the car ride home, they got into a deadly car accident and everyone in the car died except for one boy. That was the one boy who didn't take a stone from her grave. Had he done so, he wouldn't be here today. So, that is absolutely horrifying. No thanks. Moving on to number four, we have Mal Dyer. Legend goes that Mal Dyer was a witch that lived in Maryland in the 17th century. But there are no historical records of her existence, so it might have just been a legend passed down from generation to generation. Either way, it's quite creepy. So the story takes place during a brutal winter in 1697. During this winter, there wasn't a lot of food available. In fact, many residents sadly passed away from starvation. Then there was Mal Dyer. She lived basically isolated from the community. Some say she wanted it that way since she was on the run after killing her husband. Well, one cold winter night, a group of vigilantes were like, let's just take her down. So they burnt her house down and chased her around with pitchforks, calling her a witch. Maul did manage to escape, but kept running until she fell upon a large boulder. She ultimately froze to death on that boulder. Several days later, a young boy found her corpse. Her body was frozen with one of her hands on the boulder, the other outstretched up towards the sky. Some say she froze to death, putting a curse on her tormentors and the town. What's scary is that the rock that she died on is still on display in this town. In fact, her handprint is imprinted onto the rock for eternity. And Mal Dyer's curse is still effective to this day. All men responsible for her death and their ancestors will suffer for the rest of their lives. They will be cursed with bad luck. In fact, it's said that her tormentors got sick and some passed away. Others had their land become barren and their livestock died. All from the curse that Mal Dyer put on them. In our third spot today, we have the Aswang. A subscriber actually brought this next witch to my attention, so I thought I would include it in today's video, and hopefully, 
I pronounce the name right, okay? So this witch is a shape-shifting evil spirit. It's not just a witch though. It can also transform itself into a vampire, a werebeast, and a ghoul. But unlike normal vampires, this creature can go out during the day and they aren't harmed by the sunlight and they don't also sparkle. During the day though, they are often seen with bloodshot eyes because they just spent the entire night searching for houses that are holding wakes so that they can then go in and then steal the bodies and then eat them. No need to worry though, they don't attack during the day, that's when they're at their weakest. Plus, they only attack in the darkness because that's when they believe that God is asleep. But when they do hunt, they go after the young and feast on their hearts and livers. In fact, they have this thing that comes out of their mouth and then can reach into a mother's womb to suck the baby out of them while the mother is asleep. Isn't that horrifying? It is. But wait, it gets worse. Apparently humans can choose to turn into this creature if they so desire. To do this, they have to tie a fertilized chicken egg to their stomach. The chick will then pass through their flesh, and once this happens, they have to bury the shell in a bamboo tube with coconut oil and chicken poop. After that is all complete, they will gain the powers of this monster. And it sounds like I just made that all up, but I swear that's part of the legend. What's horrifying is that this witch moves quickly and silently. They are super tiny so that they can hide behind things with ease, so you'll never be able to hear or see them coming. Now, these witches are said to be extremely wicked. If you ever cross one, they'll make sure you will pay. They'll put a curse on you so that bones or insects will come out of your bodily orifices. Like imagine just sitting there and then all of a sudden a spider crawls out of your eye or you start coughing up bones. Yeah, no thank you. That's why these witches are so highly feared. Coming in at number two, we have the Bell Witch. This is one of the creepiest stories out there because it involves a real life witch and a real life curse. So it all started back in the early 1800s with a man named John Bell. Now John lived in a Tennessee farmhouse with his family. All was going well until one day he saw this weird creature. He described it as a dog like creature but with a rabbit's head. He tried to shoot at it but nothing happened. Then John's daughter Betsy started to witness freaky things as well. In fact, on a number of occasions she was attacked by an unseen force as she described it. Then other weird spooky things would happen, like they would hear chains being dragged through the house, or gulping and choking sounds and scratching at their bedposts. Finally, after months of tormenting, the entity finally spoke to them. Turns out that they were being haunted by their former neighbor, Kate Batts, who was actually a witch. She was dead set on destroying the family, especially John. She wanted to kill him. She never said why though, and I want to know why. Over the next three years, Kate tormented the entire family daily. She cast a number of spells on John from her grave. As time went on, John actually became weaker and weaker, until 1829 when he was found dead with a small vial of liquid near him. Apparently Kate, the bell witch, gave John this poison and he took his life. After his death, Kate stopped tormenting the family. So again, I want to know, what did John do to Kate to make her come for him? Like seriously, I'd never want to get on her bad side. And in our number one spot today, we have the Chattapee. The Chattapee is this creepy witch slash vampire creature from India. Legend goes that this creature is formed after a woman passes away during childbirth or after a woman takes their own life. You know the succubus demon? The demon that presents itself to men during sleep and tries to have their way with them and then can kill them? Well, this is the Indian equivalent to the succubus demon. This witch rides on a tiger during the night. She then sneaks into your home without disturbing anyone and attacks men in their sleep. She will then suck the life out of them through their toes. Yeah, you heard me, their toes. I don't know why she wants those hairy, stinky things near her face. Don't ask me. Anyways, some versions of this legend say that she has the power to change her form. She can transform into a tiger with all tiger features except one human leg. She also has hypnotic powers. She can cast a spell on the entire household so that everyone is in a trance like state and won't wake up upon her entering. That's how she can come and go with ease. Now, this witch is so powerful that she can come after the strongest of men. And just like the succubus demon, she won't kill the man in one night. So she will revisit the house over and over again, slowly draining the life out of the man. 
She draws out his death with the men falling weaker and weaker and not knowing what's causing it. Eventually he will grow so sick and pass away and no one will know that this witch was to blame. Starting off this countdown we have the Wabanaki ghost witch. This is a terrifying witch that scared Native American tribes for centuries. According to their legend, this witch was one who practiced evil magic when they were alive. And when they died, they came back to life as an undead monster. Its name is Skudigamooch and it craves human flesh and blood. The worst part, if it's coming for you, there's no stopping it. It will kill and devour any and everything that gets in its way. Now, during the day, this witch appears as an inactive human corpse. But as soon as night falls, the corpse comes to life and goes off searching for prey. In fact, it moves fairly quickly. It can transform itself into a ball of light and wisp around fast looking for someone to snack on. Once it finds its victim, it attacks from above. So you literally can't even see it coming. The legend also tells the story of one time this witch attacking a whole group of hunters and warriors. They were out spending the night in the forest when they were all attacked and killed one by one by this witch. I mean, it normally prefers to attack individuals who are on their own, but in this case, it must have been fairly hungry because it just devoured that whole group of men with ease. The only way to kill this witch is to burn her body right after she dies, or else she will come back to life and make your life a living hell. Coming in at number four, we have Grilla. In Iceland, during the Christmas holidays, children have to watch themselves if they've been naughty that year. They don't find lumps of coal in their stocking. No, they run the risk of getting eaten by a nasty witch named Grilla. Grilla is depicted as a troll-like witch that lives in the mountains of Iceland. She has the ability to sense misbehaving children, and then she keeps note of all the kids who have wronged. Some depictions of her have her with hooves and 13 to 15 tails. Other depictions have her with nasty dirty nails, ears that droop to her chin, and eyes at the back of her head. Also, she's massive. You definitely don't want to get on her bad side. Did I mention that she likes stew? Stew, of course. That's where she puts the naughty children and then eats them right up. I should also mention that Grilla has been married three times. In total, she has 72 children. 72 children that she can send after you if you ever do her wrong. Some of these children are said to be murderers, others are said to be pranksters. With her most recent husband, she had 13 children who are called the Yule Men. They're kind of like the dwarves from Snow White, except they're evil. So the Yule Men are all gnome-like creatures that go around torturing households in their own way. They are named accordingly. For example, you have Spoon Licker that will go around licking all your spoons. Then when you go to use the spoon, you get a nasty taste in your mouth. Or you have Window Peeper. He likes to lurk outside your windows and then just watch you do stuff, you know? Sometimes he will even steal the stuff he sees. On the 13 days leading up to Christmas, these Yule Lads will visit families one by one. Oh, you thought that was all? No, think again. Grilla also works alongside the Yule Cat. The Yule Cat is this monstrous beast that is said to tower above even the tallest houses. On Christmas Eve, she goes around eating sh So not only do you have to worry about Grilla, but you have to worry about her evil kids and her vicious cat that she can send after you as well. Moving on to number three, we have Nailba. In 1990s, families in Bangalore were worried after hearing a story about a scary witch named Nailba. Story goes that one night a family was about to go to bed when they heard the sound of one of their family members voice coming from outside. The father of the house opened the door about to welcome them in, but when he did, to his horrors, it was not his relative. Standing before him was an old woman, but before he could even say anything, this woman attacked him and instantly killed him. The next day, something similar happened to another family. It was late at night, they were about to go to bed when they heard a familiar voice outside. This time, the old woman attacked and killed the man with her nasty sharp nails. After a number of deaths in the village, everyone got spooked. They thought this was the works of a serial killer, but no, it was indeed something much worse. It was the work of this evil witch. And some believe the story to be true and are fearful that they too will fall victim to her. In order to avoid encountering her, people would write Nailba on the door, which means come tomorrow. The witch would then see the sign and come again tomorrow to try and kill you. But as long as the words were still written on the door, you were safe for her. You know, like she'd come, oh, I'll come again tomorrow. Oh, okay, I'll come again tomorrow. You know, just, you get it. If not, she will try to trick you into opening your door for her and then bam, you're dead. 
In our second spot today, we have La Lechuza. This is a popular witch in Mexican folklore. Legend goes that Lechuza was a woman that was caught practicing dark magic. The townsfolk were horrified and as a result had her killed. But Lechuza never fully died. She came back taking form as a creepy bird lady and promised she would seek revenge on the town. Now she is a shapeshifter. She has the ability to look like a normal woman during the day and then as a huge bird with a human's face during the night. I mean her name literally means owl in English. So she's just this terrifying owl lady that likes to kill innocent people. In some stories she is described as being 7 foot tall with a wingspan of 15 feet. She flies through the night hunting her prey. She often will perch on a tree branch and just watch from above. If you hear a bird screech at night, this is a bad omen. It's a sign that Lichuza is out looking for her next victim and it could be you. Also, this witch can pretend to be a baby to trick her victims. She can disguise her voice and cry outside your door, so you're like, oh no, someone left a baby on my doorstep and then you go outside and it's not Harry Potter left by Dumbledore. No, it's Lee Chuza who will swoop down and carry you away with her with her sharp talons. She has the strength to carry a full grown man. So no one is safe. She's also known to attack from windows. You might be trying to sleep when all of a sudden you hear this annoying whistling or screeching noise coming from outside your window. You get so annoyed you whip the window open and bam she'll attack you and scratch your eyes out. She's also known to run people off the road. So she's definitely someone you don't want to take on. And in our number one spot today we have Black Annis. Black Annis is a tall nasty witch from English folklore. She is depicted as having a blue face with glowing eyes eyes, long sharp teeth and claw like fingers which she uses to rip the skin off of her victims. So this witch is said to haunt the countryside of Leicestershire. She waits in the woods there until she finds herself the perfect victim. She will then pounce on them, rip them open and feast on them. She likes to drain them completely of blood by sucking it out of them and then feasts on their insides. To make matters worse, she will keep the deceased with her and once their skin is completely dried out, she will use the skin and sew it together to make clothes for herself. Like what the actual hell, it's giving me Buffalo Bill vibes for sure. Due to this legend, kids were told never to go into Dane Hills alone for that's where she supposedly lives. Not only that, if you're out in the woods and hear a high pitched howl, you know that she's close. Furthermore, if you listen carefully, sometimes you'll be able to hear her sharp teeth grinding together as she waits for her prey.